Are we recording yet? Yes, we are. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Kubernetes Storage in Action. I'm Jeffrey Sika, a senior software engineer at Red Hat and a cloud native ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Uh, we would like to welcome our presenter today, Sheng Yang, software architect at Rancher Labs. A uh, few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. Uh, there is a QA uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Uh, if there are a couple poignant questions during the presentation, Cheng said that uh, we can uh, feel free to grab him and then try and answer them while it's relevant. Uh, this is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such uh, is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful to all of uh, your fellow participants and presenters. Uh, the recording and slides will be posted later today on the CNCF webinar page. Um, we'll provide a link to that, but it's cncf.io slash webinars. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Sheng to kick off today's presentation. Sheng. Hi, so welcome everyone. So this is Shen Yang, I'm from Rancher Labs. And today our topic is Kubernetes storage in action. So, um, all right. So first, a little bit about myself. I've been uh, with uh, Rancher Labs since 2015. And uh, before that, I also worked at Intel for the KVM kernel development and uh, at the Citrix and cloud.com for the cloud stack development. So you can find me using uh, Yasker at uh, GitHub, Twitter, and Medium. And also, if necessary, you can uh, send me email for any questions you have in the session to shane.yang at ranch.com. So I will glad to answer them. So with that, let's get started. So the reason I um, the reason we are having this webinar is the concept of the persistent storage in the Kubernetes is a little bit um, always a little bit confusing. And from what I heard from um, the end users and the um, many talk I had in doing the multiple Kubecons, there's people always asking about uh, many difference between the like PV, PVC, other uh, read, write ones, read and many, those kind of concepts in Kubernetes. So that's one thing we want to talk about today is goes through the persistent storage concept in the Kubernetes in one go. And I will try to explain them as clear as possible. And I will make sure that you can, you are going to get a concrete understanding of the Kubernetes storage concept after this webinar. And the second part of this webinar is I'm going to show you how to use persistent storage in Kubernetes doing a live demo. And for the live demo purpose, we are going to use uh, Rancher and the Longhorn, which are two open source projects in, in the Kubernetes area. And uh, you are feel free to download them and try them by yourselves. So the first thing I want to talk about is like just listed the, um, the concept of persistent storage in the Kubernetes. The most common one you might have hear, heard about is persistent volume and the persistent volume plane. So in short, what the persistent volume is, is a piece of storage can be used for the Kubernetes like Kubernetes pod. And the persistent volume claim is a request for the persistent volume, in short PV. And the, pers uh, the one misconception, one common misconception about persistent volume and persistent volume claim is you probably think like, okay, persistent volume is like a storage pool and the persistent volume claim is going to cough in one part of it. In fact, that's not true. So in Kubernetes, persistent volume and persistent volume claim is always going to be one to one binding um, relationship. So one persistent volume can only be used by the one persistent volume claim and the one persistent volume claim, of course, are only going to be uh, bind by the one persistent volume as well. I will explain more of that later. So the next concept you're going to likely encounter is the storage class. So the storage class is essentially a connection of uh, persistent volumes and in uh, when the storage class work with the provisioner and uh, you can have a dynamic created persistent volume instead of static allocated persistent volume by the other means. So I will go into more detail on that later as well. So the last concept you're probably going to encounter is just simply called volume. 
But in the um, for the volume inside Kubernetes, in fact, it's just referred to the storage, whatever storage used by the pod. So it's not necessarily persistent. So if the volume is point to, pointing to a persistent volume claim, then we will assume that this volume is most likely to be persistent storage. But if the volume is using something like host path or empty directory, and those are not really treated as persistent. So here, um, in fact, the, the persistent world, the persistent storage in Kubernetes has evolved a bit since the incubation of Kubernetes. So the one major event in this um, involvement is uh, the storage class. So before storage class was in, introduced in Kubernetes, it's, I think it's introduced about in the 1.5, 1.6, around that time. And before that, every time, um, what's the, re, uh, the model of persistent storage is that the storage the main have to allocate persistent volume first, and then there will be a bunch of uh, persistent volume claim try to bound it into the persistent volume. For example, now we have create a multiple pods and the pods have volume and the volume going to pointer to a persistent volume claim. And in this case, Kubernetes is going to try to match the persistent volume claim to any existing persistent volume through the parameter like the capacity, like and the performance, and the using those parameter to find the PV that matched the requirement of PVC. So once Kubernetes found the required PV, um, uh, the PV met the requirement of PVC, they're going to bound them. And you can see that the PV status will become bounded and the, the PVC will start using pointing to that PV and the, then the, the pod can start using the PV as a part, as a volume inside the pod. So this model have a few um, issues. The first one is like, the, since the PVC only specify this, uh, like some spe, um, spe, uh, spec, like the size of the PV, uh, the storage, what you want, the PV can be over satisfied, like just say the spec of the PV can be better than the PVC wants. For example, I only ask a PVC for like one gigabyte of volume, but there's no existing free PV, which that with one gigabyte of free space, the, the uh, smallest PV I have might be 100 gigabytes. So in this, even in this case, in this case, Kubernetes was still going to bind that 100 gigabytes PV into the PVC, which is resulting in the waste of space. Another issue with this model is that those PVs are static created by the storage admin beforehand. So in order for this model to work well, the storage admin have to be involved in, and in the older process that's um, using the storage, uh, the persistent storage. And the, essentially the storage admin have to predict that how many PVs and what's the PV size going to be used by the PVC, which is next to impossible. So this provide, uh, so this model provides very good like um, uh, permission and the, the request isolation, but it's not really partic uh, particular um, flexible when we we'll want to have a lot of pod and the volumes with a lot of PV and the PVCs things storage and the main need to be manually involved in every step of this allocation. So when, uh, when, after Kubernetes realized, uh, Kubernetes community realized this problem, they, make, uh, they introduced the concept of the storage class and the provisioner. So in the new model, the storage class with provisioner is basically operate as um, in the role of the storage and the main, but the, sorry, but it can down the work automatically. So in this case, we still have four PVCs and the four PVC had different requirements and the, the pod were going to create as, as same as before, the volume point to the PVC and the PV, in this case, PVC, we are going to see, okay, uh, is there is any existing PV can meet my requirement? If not, PVC are going to talk with the storage class with the provisioner and the provisioner we are going to provision new PVs to according to the spec requested by the PVC. 
So those new PVs will going to match the spec of PVC 100%. For example, if you are going to ask for one gigabyte of volume, the, store, the provisioner will provision you um, most likely the one gigabyte of volume as with the, like say based on SSD and the provisioner will do that as well. So in this case, you are going to have a strictly matched spec between the PV and the PVC. And also you don't need to worry about get the storage main manually involved in any volume creation process. So of course, after the PV was created automatically by the storage class and the provisioner, the PVC will going to bound with the PV and the pod can start use the volume again. <clears throat> Sorry. So another, um, so in this case, you can see that it was introduced of the storage class, the uh, allocation of the volume and the persistent volume become more flexible. And uh, you can, and also that's one thing about the storage class is, the, um, I, as you notice that mention, I mentioned here that storage class will be with the provisioner to automatically provision the new PVs, but also you can use storage class without the provisioner. So that storage class will essentially become a connection of the PV. So in this case, if you specify the certain storage class, and uh, if there are multiple PVs with that storage class, some PVC will go into only bound into one of the PVs with the same storage class as the PVC specified. So that's also a way for you to allocate existing PVs in, into one group and make sure that PVC is going to grab some PVs and bound, bound to them within the group. But most, in the most uh, common cases, the story class is working with the provisioner to provide the dynamic provision feature to the PVCs. So that's about PV, PVC, and the storage class and provisioner. The next, con the next concept we're going to talk about is uh, read write once and the read write many. So those are the access mode of the PV can have in the Kubernetes. So the read write once means that you can only, the, the storage can only be read write on a single node at any given time. And the read write many means that you can read write on multiple nodes at the same time. So why it caused the difference? In fact, the difference is caused by what's the, how the storage was um, the, uh, the internal functionality of the storage. The read write once type storage is most likely the high performance block storage like uh, AWS EBS, Azure Disk, Google Persistent Disk, Cypher Media, and the long form. So the block device is, since the block device can only be attached in the one node, and also you cannot modify the block device contents without the file system knowing. So the block device is most likely unable to be read write at a single node. But in other cases, you can probably read only using read only manning for the block device as well. Like you can mount this block device on the multiple nodes, as long as you are not writing anything to it, you can, you can still read from it. So the read write many type storage is most likely distributed file system. So like uh, AWS EFS, NFS, GlassFS, and CFS. So the read write many the type of storage is on the file system level. So any change you done on the multiple node will be made aware to the file system and the file system are going to have a protocol to deal with that. So then, so you are able to use the, um, this type of storage across the different node. So, but the, on, the, on, the, on the contrary, sometimes you, um, that is because the, it's involved in more locking and the file system level protocol, the performance of the distributed file system is probably not as good as the dedicated block device. So talking about uh, uh, the read write months, uh, read write many type of access mode, we need to talk also think about how to use them. So there's two common way of using persistent volume in the Kubernetes. One is using deployment, another one is using stateful set. So of course, everybody is probably going to most familiar with this deployment. And the, 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 deploy, the deployment has a property that the ports in the one deployment is going to share the same volume. 
and the deployment can be, in, as you know, the deployment can be spread across different parts. So, no so the storage for the deployment have to match the uh, requirement that no matter which node the pod is running, the storage must be accessible on that node. So the deployment is more suitable for the read write mining type of storage. On the other hand, because some uh, workload can scale really well hor um, horizontally, so we, uh, we also have a concept of the stateful set in the Kubernetes. So each port in the one stateful set can have one volume. That is because we have a, a new concept here called volume claim template. The volume claim template is essentially automatically provision new PVs and with the PVC specification, and uh, they are going to use that uh, newly created PVC for each part for each part in the stateful set. So in this case, if you have workload can uh, scale horizontally really well, you can have a stable set for that workload and using the high performance read write ones type of storage like block device with your, with your stateful set and with your workload. All right, so, so then, um, we have, a, um, so I'm the maintainer on the Longhorn project and the Longhorn is a CNCF, CNCF sandbox project and it's a distributed block storage software for Kubernetes and the Longhorn is 100% open source. So Longhorn is in the catalog at the read write once type of storage as I mentioned before with the EBS and others. So what we, what, we've, what we do with Longhorn is we want it to provide, easily provide persistent storage support to any Kubernetes cluster. So you can find more details about Longhorn at longhorn.io. And uh, I'm going to demonstrate how to use Longhorn and Rancher and the Kubernetes to, do, um, uh, to operate on persistent storage later. Just a little bit update on the, what's the latest status of Longhorn. So uh, the latest release is 0 0.7 release. And uh, the long week, as I said before, Longhorn is enterprise grade distributed block storage software for Kubernetes. And we support volume snapshot inside the cluster. And also you can back up and restore volume from outside the cluster like S3 or NFS server. We also support the storage tag for the node and the disk selection. For example, if you have some data that doesn't require very uh, fast access the um, Faster bandwidth, you are going. You can have uh, the label for, for example, SSD and NVMe on one side, and the label um, for the spinning disk on the other side. So you can choose the different uh, speed of your disk using the storage tag. Longhorn also support cross cluster disaster recovery volume with defined RTO and RPO. So RTO here is a recovery time objective, and RPO is a recovery point objective. So this is those two parameters define that how soon and the when, how soon you can recover your volume in your backup cluster and what's the point of data is going to be uh, re recovered in your backup cluster. Longhorn also support live upgrade of software without impacting the roaming volumes. And we have also have intuitive UI, which is the one of the first thing many users like about Longhorn. And of course, um, Longhorn is right on top of Kubernetes and using Kubernetes controller pattern. So we support one click installation and it's very easy to install. I will demonstrate that later. So of course we have more feature coming and uh, let's start the demo. All right, so uh, before our demo, do we have any questions? None have popped up so far. Okay. Okay, so here what you see um, is the UI from Rancher. So everybody see the UI? Yep, you're looking good. Okay, so um, as you may know, the Rancher is the Kubernetes management platform. It's also 100% open source and the Rancher can manage multiple clusters, multiple Kubernetes clusters from different provider, no matter it's on-premises or in the cloud. As you see here, this is um, the three of clusters is in the digital ocean and one cluster is my node. So let's go dive into the demo. 
So when you click into the demo dashboard, uh, when, uh, cluster dashboard, you're going to see um, the CPU and memory usage and the pod stats. And, and the, you can see that this cluster is, come from, uh, is with the three nodes and the, which help on the CPU and what's the version of the Kubernetes and the Docker on top of node. So the storage type here, you can see that we don't have any persistent storage, persistent volume or storage class created. So we are going to now start install by installing Longhorn to add persistent uh, storage feature to this cluster. So to install Longhorn is very easy. Just go to the uh, project and click app and click launch and find Longhorn in the Rancho catalog. And Longhorn, of course, is also available in storing from the YAML or from Helm chart. And uh, in the back end, this is using the Helm chart as well. So I don't need to change everything, I just click launch. Well, uh, when we are installing Longhorn, let's go back to the dashboard for the demo cluster. And in fact, we can launch Kube Control here. And it's where, um, you can just run every command using Kube Control. Oh, nothing is on default, but yeah. So now the Longhorn is installing in the Longhorn system namespace, and you can see the things that are running here. And of course, you can see the real time status of all the part in the workload here. So it's, it's installing it right now. Haven't finished yet, I think. Let's see if I can access the UI yet. Oh, okay. In fact, the UI is ready now. So in the long form dashboard, you can see what uh, the current status, like how many volumes you have, what's the state healthy of them, and how many storage you are available for you to create new volumes, and how many nodes is here. On the node page, you can configure the uh, well Longhorn are going to use the space, uh, the space on the disk to back up to uh, back in the Longhorn volumes. And uh, of course, we don't have any volume right now. And uh, Longhorn also, as I mentioned before, Longhorn also support backing up to others. And let me set the backup target first. So that is the setting to uh, S3, and you can see that we already have some backup here. So let's dive into the persistent volume and start using it. I think I need to refresh this. Oh, yes. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is I want to um, start a WordPress application, which is using Helm chart and using Kubernetes, uh, using Longhorn, persistent volume. So this is a standard uh, WordPress Helm chart. And you can select WordPress persistent volume enabled and using Longhorn as storage class. And also, you know that uh, WordPress Helm chart has two parts. One is WordPress itself, another one is the database, MariaDB. So we want to use the storage class for MariaDB as well. So let's click launch here. And from here, we should be able to see that there are two volumes created. So Longhorn is communicating with uh, Kubernetes using the CLI interface and the volumes are being attached. And the same to healthy. And you can also see from the Longhorn, from the Longhorn UI that the volume is this volume is using by the MariaDB, another volume is for using by the WordPress itself. And you can click to see the details. So okay. So let's go and see how the persistent volume uh, how, let's see the persistent volume and the storage class. So in the storage tab now you can see that we have two persistent volume and the states will be bound. And the storage class, of course, when you install Longhorn, we are going to create a new storage class with dynamic provisioning feature. And you will see here in the storage class tab. You can also see that 
using the coupe control. And uh, uh, in short, because yeah, in Rancher we type coupe control so many times, so we normally just shorten it to use a K. So you can just do K get PD, and you see two persistent volume is uh, use uh, has been created, and you see you use K get a storage class. Yeah, you can see the long run is there. So we can take a look into deep about uh, the PVs here and see what it has. So this PV has been associated with the, let me see, okay. This, you can see that this PV is using the CSR driver and using the Longhorn. And we're using file system as x 4 SL default and some other parameters uh, provided by Longhorn. And also you can see that this PV contains the size of the volume we want, which is in fact determined by the PVC. This is 10 gigabytes. And this PVC, and also this PV contains the info to referring to the PVC is using the PV, like this PV is using by the PVC name in the name WordPress, in the namespace WordPress. So let's take a look at that PVC as well. So now we have the, we have seen this, um, we switch to the WordPress namespace and take a look at the PVC. And the previously we see this volume, you see this volume name here. Then in fact, this is the PV which associated with the, this PVC name in the WordPress. We can take more into, we can look into that more. You can see this word, this PVC was created with access mode rate white ones, which is suitable for Longhorn. And also they ask a request as resource as a storage 10 gig and the storage class as Longhorn. So that is how this PVC are able to find Longhorn uh, storage system and able to create a new PV to met its demands. And you can see the waiting mode is file system, another waiting mode available in the newer Kubernetes release is a raw block device. So the volume name will be the this PVC dash six EA something. This is the PV name we mentioned before. So let's take a look at the storage class. So this is the storage class. How storage class looks like. The most important parameter here is you have to uh, specify the provisioner if you want to do dynamic provision for the storage class. And another one is reclaim policy, which means that what, what will happen if the PV has been uh, unbounded for the PVC, and uh, if you, oh, sorry. The if reclaim policy is what will happen if uh, uh, the PV was going to be removed, is going to be deleted out. In this case, another one is recycled. And also there was special annotation here. So uh, by default, uh, default storage class means that if you are creating a PV without specified storage class, this one will be, um, this, um, this storage class will be used as in default. So let's go back and take a look at uh, the pod is currently running. See some questions. Okay, so um, yeah, so I see some questions here, so I can't. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you wanted to answer them at the end because some of them weren't necessarily related to what you were talking about. Okay, all but right. If you want, we can tackle a couple of them right now. Okay, so um, yeah, so first question I saw from Rush is that is it possible to use Longhorn in a deployment? Um, it's possible for Longhorn to use in the deployment, but you will not, you are not able to scale beyond one node since it's read write once, and the Longhorn cannot be run in the read write many mode. The next question is coming from Reno. So the question is what will be the default data location for Longhorn or how can I allocate space that Longhorn can use? 
So the default data location will be at uh, slash uh, wallib uh, rancher longhorn, and we are changing that to slash longhorn slash wallib longhorn. So in order to allocate space for longhorn, you can just mount a new um, have some block device on the node and mount it, format it in ext 4 or XFS and mount it on the, some directory on the node and tell Longhorn about it. So we can see it from here. In the Longhorn UI, so you have the node here and you can edit this node and you can add a disk, which put in, and put in a different path here. And then you can have a diff, another disk using uh, for uh, propel for Longhorn. So also we see that the default path is while it range Longhorn at this release. So the next question is, well, does Longhorn provision the actual underlying storage? Does this using EBS automatically deploying the AWS? Uh, the answer is no. We currently uh, just depends on how the users, um, how the user, um, the, the disk has been mounted on the, node, on the node. So in order to use EBS, you need to um, create a EBS volume, attach it to the VM and the format and the mounted on the node, then you just supply the path to the Longhorn like that. But we are also considering automatic provision on new um, block devices if you see using some cloud provider solutions. So what's the difference between the PV get deleted and the recycled? So the PV get deleted is basically means, uh, if I remember correctly, is that when the PVC is get deleted, the PV is going to get deleted along with it. And if the reclaim policy is recycled, if the PVC was deleted, the PV will not get deleted automatically. It will going to be just there, remain as unbounded, but it's the content will still be there and the next PVC can pick it up. Um, in fact, it's not really 100% safe if you do this way because you know that the data can be reused. So can you compile Longhorn with Ceph? So um, the, one of the motivation we develop Longhorn is because we kind of think Ceph is too complicated. And uh, we heard uh, because our previous experience is like with Cloud Stack, which is like competitive for OpenStack. So there are many, uh, there are some user stories about how hard the self is, to, how hard to operate and those. So the long form itself is more, is much simpler. So we only use uh, replicas to store the data. We're not doing striping and we try to keep the code as simple as, po uh, as, simple as possible. And also, we also have the backup building backup mechanism compared to self. So the self doesn't have building backup mechanism. And the Ceph itself is not really cloud native because uh, uh, Ceph was built before, of course, before the Kubernetes was born. And uh, of course, as you know, that the project Rook is uh, helping Ceph to become cloud native. But that is, uh, to, to our understanding, of course, that will be another layer on top of Ceph. So it's going to be introduced more um, factors to more complexity factors to, to the operation. So where do you specify the volume mode at file system while deploying the WordPress app? The, the volume mode at file system is the kind of default setting for uh, provisioners. So unless you, um, as you specify the volume mode to be the uh, raw block device, they're going to by default the file system. And also the volume, um, the volume mode is also determined in the, the request of the PVC, which is in, which is in the uh, WordPress chart and the WordPress charts already defined it. Okay, so we're already using Rancher. We can expect Longhorn to be product grade. So Longhorn to be, um, we are targeting Q, uh, Q2 this year for the Longhorn to reach GA. So that's, uh, well, in, at that time, we're going to support Longhorn and the way claim is to be the production grade. And now Longhorn is still in the beta release. So, can you elaborate how it works on the multi-cluster configuration and RPO, RTO limits? Well, um, that's a topic is probably too deep for this, uh, for this webinar. So I can briefly talk, briefly talk about that. So the, in the multi-cluster configuration, it's running as a an, an master backup-like setup. And uh, we are going to constantly pull from the backup target, to the backup store for the latest data that's shipping from the master uh, cluster. 
So the backup cluster is going to get a refresh. Uh, you can define the refresh every how long you want. And uh, the RPO, RTO limitation, the RPO limitation is it depends on how often you are going to back up your volume in the master cluster. The RTO, the RTO limitation is also determined by um, uh, how fast you can transfer, um, activate the volume and put into the workload. I, I would say that RTO limitation um, will be uh, pretty optimal and RPO will depends on your setup. Oh, sorry, I think I just running click some. All right, so that's all the questions we have right now. Let's go back to the demo. Okay, so this one. Okay, so as you can see right now, the WordPress is up and you can see it's function well. Everything seems working. And you can add new post. Yes. Okay, everything seems fine. So we can dive deep into how WordPress is using uh, the, the pod and you can click here. We can see the volume. One is of course config map, another one is volume claim template, called data. And in fact, we probably see that better from the Kube control. Let's do that. So as you can see right now, the WordPress namespace has two parts. We can see the MariaDB one. Oh. Okay, so you can see here, this one data volume is using the claim the data WordPress dash MariaDB dash one. So, but how it got here? So that is because we have, the WordPress is using stateful set for MariaDB. So as you can see here, So this stateful set, the first part you will see that is just typical uh, spec for NT, uh, for the container, right? But one part is stateful set only feature is this volume claim template. So the volume claim template defines that what's the, uh, how to create a new uh, PVC automatically if I'm going to scale the, scale the database. We'll say that we are going to have those um, labeled and also the PVC is going to create it must be read write once and the resource must be 8 GB and the storage class name is Longhorn and the volume mode is file system. So this is specified in the volume claim template inside, a, uh, inside the WordPress chart. So in fact, we, I can just scale up. I can scale up the database and you will see what's going to happen. In fact, I haven't tried this before. Yeah, I hope it won't fail. Okay, so a new volume has been provisioned automatically. You can see the third one and you're going to get attached and uh, it's going to be used by the new MariaDB pod. Let's see here, wasn't up yet. Okay, so container started. And the, as you see, you can also see the log from the, uh, from the wrench as well. Okay, when will you become ready? 
well, I'm a little bit regretting. I'm, I'm not sure if you actually tried this. Oh, okay. All right. Now it's fine. Okay, so at the same time, yeah, as you can see there, a new warning has been created by uh, for the MariaDB one in in Longhorn because uh, MariaDB is using volume claim template to create new new volumes. And also, in fact, for in the Longhorn UI, you can click into each volume and see what's the detailed information about it. So uh, here on the right side, you will see that you have three replicas running on different nodes and which paths you are using. And the tooltip here shows exactly place that Longhorn stored your data. So since we're doing um, just 100% replication, so you can, as long as you have the data on this path, for example, if you have node crash or Kubernetes cluster crash, as long as you have hard drive and it still contains this data, it's still possible, we can still uh, recover from that crash and still uh, get your data back. So that is the one of the fail safe mechanism designed by designed in Longhorn. So on the left side, you can see that uh, the volume current is attached and healthy and uh, you have uh, attached a node to the Longhorn demo two. And uh, this is uh, the block device on the Longhorn demo two that's exposed by the Longhorn system. The size and the actual size Longhorn take on the space, since we're doing the same provisioning, the actual size is only 200 megabytes and most of them, in fact, it's just the file system and the engine and some other parameters. So down here, we have a snapshot screen and you can take a snapshot. And just remember that a snapshot is made in within the cluster and also you can create a backup and you can add a label to your backup if you want. And you can see that it's copying to the uh, backup store right now. Okay, that's uh, quick. So recurring snapshot and backup schedule. So we have the building mechanism for you to create backup and the snapshot um, on the schedule for like daily or weekly or monthly back uh, upgrade. So I'm going, uh, sorry, monthly backup. So that is why we want to ensure that your data always has a copy outside the cluster. So when you lost your whole cluster, you are not going to lose your whole data. So here, just for testing purpose, I'm going to do a backup every minute and click save. And this should be kicking in about minutes. So let's go back to the... Okay, so I can, I, let me see if I have any questions. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so I saw the questions about access mode and the use case for each of them. So the, um, basically the thing is, if you want to use, um, the basic concept is if you have a workload that can scale horizontally, like a, like a database, most databases can scale horizontally and doing the shard. And uh, when you uh, have that kind of workload, you better use the read write ones block device with the stateful set. So you can easily have a different storage for uh, different block storage, different storage for the different parts across a different node. But, sorry. So, but if you don't have that, uh, uh, but if you have the workload that's going to scale, but they, uh, they are planning to share the same storage, they can have some, something like internal logs and they have multiple instances able to share the same storage and then you can use read write of mining type of storage. And uh, in that case, you can use deployment and read write mining type of storage to scale your workload. And in that case that all this workload, all these parts were going to share the same volume. So you can see that they can, they can be some bottleneck on the performance, but uh, if your workload only allow that, there will be your way. So there was one other question that was in the chat, not actually in the Q and A. Yeah. Um, do you want me to read that off to you? Sure. Uh, if a node needs maintenance and has to be upgraded and all the containers need to be migrated, can you describe the process when you already have a bound PV that is local storage? This can happen with local storage and PMEM backed volumes. Okay, so uh, if, you have the, if you have the workload and if you're going to, uh, you, uh, if you have the node, you have to uh, 
most likely you have to drain it, and there the pod will be moved. Uh, since if you are using deployment or stateful set, they are going to be uh, less than ideal replicas on that node, on the, on the whole scale, so the pod will be moved into other node. And uh, then, but if you are using uh, local storage, in fact, the local storage, I need some clarification here. If you mean by local storage is that storage is bound on that node, like uh, another project I have, just local path provisioner. In that case, that your storage is always bound that by that node, so you cannot really move that storage. So the other part, we're not going to have the storage available to you and win startup. So in that case, you are going to lose one replica. But if you have some system like Longhorn, you can, that storage will be migrate into another node because that uh, the Longhorn or some other uh, storage system like Ceph are going to have a replica on the old, no old nodes. So they can connect back to the, their replicas or their data uh, through a different node and then continue functioning from there. All right. So that's all for my uh, presentation. Let's go back to, uh, that's all for my demo. Let's go back to our presentation. I've, I think I have one another slide. All right. So um, just one last thing mentioned about Longhorn. So the next, in the next release, 0.a release, we're going to have volume resizing, topology support, and live, live upgrade V2 coming. So the volume resizing is a feature many users has been requested. So now we support volume resizing uh, from the Kubernetes 1.16 release, since that is the first time that volume resizing become better beta in the Kubernetes. The Kubernetes topology support in a previous known as a filial domain is a new feature adding the Kubernetes, the Kubernetes to help uh, deal with the, uh, the replication into different, in the one region, but in the different availability zone. Like the case that if you are using EKS, a, uh, you are going to have a region-wise um, control plane by default, but your node can fall into different AZs. And, and also, the one thing about uh, AWS is that your EBS volume is in fact bound to the AZ. It cannot be migrated across the AZ. So if you have one region down, uh, sorry, one availability zone down, this kind of cases, you are going to lose that data in that AZ. So what we add is on top of, on top of the EBS, we, you can use Longhorn to provide across availability zone support using this new topology support we added in 0.a release. So after that, we don't expect many major changes and we are targeting Q2 2020 for the Longhorn 1.0 GA release. And you can follow up the latest update at github.longhorn.com uh, slash Longhorn Longhorn milestones. And also for the Longhorn related content of uh, uh, um, Longhorn related discussion, you're welcome to join uh, the CNCF Longhorn channel or the Rancher user Longhorn channel. So we, we are migrating from the, CNC, uh, the, the Rancher user channel to the, long, uh, to the CNCF channel since we have uh, become the CNCF sandbox project. So that's all for my uh, presentation. So any other questions? Uh, yeah, if there are any other questions, we do have time for a few more. Uh, you can just click the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but if there are no other questions in the next like minute or so, I think we'll wrap it up. All right. All right. Uh, thanks, Sheng, for a great presentation. Um, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us. Um, this webinar rec uh, recording and slides will be online later today. We are looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. And please have a great day. Thank you.